everyone, and thank you for coming to today's Play Attention professional training. My name is Gwen Sorley, and I will be your host today. I really do appreciate you being here today, and I hope that we have fun learning about the different features within Play Attention. Hopefully, you'll learn about some of the features that may be new to you or you haven't been utilizing as much as you should and that you'll be able to take some of the practical strategies and tips that we discussed today and start applying them in your center as soon as next week with your clients. So a couple of things I want to mention. One is that we are recording this event. So at the end of the webinar, uh, you will receive the replay link. That way you'll be able to review any sections of this webinar. And you'll also be able to share it with your colleagues if they were unable to attend the live presentation. Now, our agenda today, the first part, we're going to be going through just different tips and strategies for an effective play attention program. And uh, like I said earlier, I do hope that some of these uh, strategies you'll be able to utilize right away. We'll be talking about different features. Maybe we'll discuss a feature that you haven't been utilizing, or you get a new perspective on that feature and get a good understanding of why you're using that feature and maybe use it even more effectively. It's very interesting because we have a very diverse group today. We have some individuals who just received their Play Attention program last week. And then we have some individuals like Jim and Susan who are registered for today and they've been using Play Attention for 20 years. So we have a lot of different experience levels here today. So we will be taking everything from the top down. So for some of you, this may be a review, but it's a, always a great opportunity to review and refresh what you're doing. Now, at the end of this session, we're going to take about a 30 minute break. So what I would like to do is go through the first part and you'll notice that I have the presentation on the left hand side of your screen and I actually have my play attention program up on the right hand side of the screen. Because if I'm talking about a feature, I then want to go to my play attention um, my play attention program and actually show you how to use that feature. So I hope that will really help you step by step start incorporating these features. Now also, I am going to go straight through uh, this session and I do not have my chat box up so I can't see your questions or your comments right now. So I'd like to go through this initial presentation and then take that 30 minute break, grab a snack and think about what we discussed. Once you've really reflected on what we've discussed, jot down some of your questions. And when we come back after that break, we'll have a Q&A specifically about this section and successful play attention sessions. Then we'll go right into the iLab features. Now remember, iLab allows you to do small group training and also distance training. Some of you have already incorporated iLab and some of you have not yet incorporated iLab. If you haven't started iLab in your uh, practice as of yet, I think this is a really good session to attend because it will really allow you to get a good understanding of iLab. I have lots of videos of an actual session with a couple of my clients and you'll be able to see that session and the different features in use. So it may give you some ideas for a different business model as well. So let's get started. And again, like I mentioned before, I don't have my chat box up, but please do keep note of your questions or your comments if you have anything you want to share. If I talk about a feature and you are using that feature and you wanna share how you're using it, please keep those, uh, those comments because when we come back after the break, we're going to have a section for just Q&A. Okay, so let's get started. Again, we're gonna be talking about how to run a successful play attention session. I think that we should start by making certain you all understand what you have. What is play attention? 
what makes Play Attention so different from any other program available and why is it so effective? Play Attention is the only program that integrates real-time feedback with cognitive skill training and behavior shaping to provide you with the most comprehensive approach available. That is really essential for you to know and to be able to express to your clients. So you have the real-time feedback with that body wave technology. Remember that body wave armband is monitoring their attentive state. And then we integrate that into specific cognitive skill training. Those cognitive skills that we address within play attention are all of the skills that lay the foundation for strong executive function. And then not only do we incorporate cognitive skill training, but we also incorporate behavior shaping. So we can help clients actually start to learn how to control behaviors not conducive to good attention. So once again, Play Attention is the only program available that integrates real-time feedback or NASA-inspired feedback technology with cognitive skill training and behavior shaping. It also incorporates the catalyst necessary for brain change. Now, we do know through neuroplasticity that the brain is moldable, it's shapeable. And if we provide our clients with the right tool and the right challenge, they will be able to develop these new neural pathways they need in order to have strong executive function. There are certain catalysts necessary for brain change though, because brain change doesn't just occur right? There have to be certain catalysts in place. And we incorporate that into the play attention program. The very first catalyst necessary for brain change is of course, attention. You can be a fantastic counselor, or you can be a great teacher. But if your student or your client has a hard time paying attention to your teaching method or your counseling, and has a difficult time processing the information and controlling impulsive responses, then it's going to be very difficult for them to get maximum benefit from your teaching or from your counseling. So attention is critical to brain change. And that's why we make certain that all of our activities are brain enabled, meaning in order for them to work on any cognitive skill, they have to be paying attention. If they're not paying attention, of course, the activity will stop or the character will go in the wrong direction. We'll wait for them to become actively engaged before we move on. So that is a critical component to sparking that brain change. The other is challenge. We have to have challenge in order to improve. And challenge is incorporated into play attention a couple of different ways. But one way you may have not noticed is that that body wave armband integrates with our special algorithm. And this is what we call our auto adjust algorithm. That means when you put that body wave armband on, we're only looking at your best ability to pay attention. And all of the activities are based on that. Now, if you are able to reach or exceed that level of attention, which means you're able to activate the activity or you keep the character going in the right direction. If you're able to maintain that for a given number of seconds, then in the background, we gradually raise the bar just a little bit more, which means now you have to be that much more attentive in order to be successful. So we keep it at that constant challenge because we know that if you're 100% successful, you're not going to learn anything. So we incorporate that auto adjust algorithm to make certain that you are always challenged. Now the opposite is true too. We also know that if you start getting a little fatigued and you're not able to reach that same level of attention, then we're going to bring that bar down to your last successful level and gradually build you back up. So we're always keeping you at a challenging yet success-based pace, and that's the best pace for learning. Now, that's really important, and maybe some of you didn't realize this, but that's why some of your students may say, but I'm really trying and I can't get them to move in the right direction. 
and he's been doing really well. The auto adjust algorithm probably kicked in and now it's just a little bit more challenging. So keep that in mind. We're always challenging you or your clients based on your personal ability. We also have a deliberate practice model. That means you can't just come in to play attention session and go through the motions, right? Our artificial intelligence called Sheer Genius sets up a deliberate practice model. And with deliberate practice, that means there's goal setting. So that is when your student logs in and remember they have to do a particular activity at least seven times before a goal is set because we want to know that student's ability before setting a goal. So once they do seven act, that one activity seven times, then a goal is set. So it may say uh, today's goal is to pay attention or complete attention stamina with 72% attention. And if you're able to do that, you'll earn a point and the point goes into their reward system. So goal setting is a big part of this. And the goals, there's a hierarchy. And those goals are the goals they have to reach, the benchmarks they have to reach in order to graduate to the next level of difficulty. So there's a very important, uh, important, um, it's very important, I guess I, that's what I'm trying to say. It's very important that we set those goals so that they're always working towards a higher level of achievement, but they're mini goals. So if the goal today is to maintain 72% attention or higher on this particular activity, you know that the last time they worked on this activity, they completed it with 70% attention. So they're small achievable goals that we set. So again, the catalysts necessary for brain change are all incorporated within play attention. We mandate that they're paying attention. So attention is a big part of your program. Then we also provide challenge with our uh, algorithm, our auto adjust algorithm. And then we put in place a deliberate practice model so that there are always higher levels of achievement to reach for. There is goal setting and there's immediate feedback throughout. Now, who are you working with? Just a quick reminder of who really benefits from play attention, because some of you may have thought, I'm just going to work with school-aged children, but there are some other individuals that you can work with effectively within play attention. So I just want to give you a good overview of who we work with typically. We do recommend that the client is at least five years old, but as we know, it's never too late to learn. So you can work all the way up through adulthood, or as we say, through 105. Clients with weak executive function, those individuals who may be uh, diagnosed with ADHD or they may be undiagnosed, clients with autism, Clients with traumatic brain injury. Many times individuals who have suffered a traumatic brain injury struggle in the specific cognitive skills that we address. They may have lost certain skills due to injury and you can address that within your play attention program. Those individuals, of course, struggling with self-regulation, those that need work in those core cognitive skills necessary for learning or strong executive function, Individuals with an IEP or 504, I know many of you here today are working in school settings. So know that play attention is a great opportunity to work into your IEPs. You can actually align your play attention goals with the goals that are written within your IEP. And of course, if you have a 504 in place for that student and you have lots of different accommodations, you know, you have special notebooks, you have a process for remembering instructions, this program is going to make those accommodations much more effective because when you can help that student develop the core cognitive skills that they need, then they can actually apply the accommodations successfully. And also we work with individuals who may not have a deficit in any of these areas. They simply want to use it as peak performance training. 
So if you have a group of students who may be doing test prep for college, maybe SAT prep, this is a great opportunity to use it as peak performance training. Um, because remember that auto adjust algorithm that we talked about, you can have a great attention level. You can have really good skill set, but we are always going to challenge your personal skills. So you can use it as peak performance training. Even those individuals who want to improve in sports use play attention for peak performance. So that is a great idea to use as well. So let's go ahead and get into the tips and strategies to use for a successful play attention program. Very first is to assess your students' particular needs. You really want to take some time before you even start working with that client and know what they're good at, what they enjoy, and what areas need to be improved. You know, that's what I always start with. Tell me what your child is really good at. What does he enjoy? Or if you're working with an adult, what are you good at? What do you enjoy? Start with that. Not only does it help you develop a rapport with that individual, but it tells you a lot about that person. And remember, they're going to say they're creative and they have lots of great ideas and they can hyper-focus. And we want to make certain they understand we're not going to change any of those great characteristics that they have, but we're going to teach them how to manage those areas like hyper-focus so that those can remain positives in their life. And then we also, of course, want to know the areas that we need to improve so we can pinpoint those in their uh, customized profile. You can use a wealth of different uh, ways to do your assessments. And some of you may already be using the Connors or the Vanderbilt or the Basque. Many of you may already be using those. The two that we typically use are FOCUS. Remember, FOCUS is a norm reference test of attentional control. It is computer-based. It takes 20 minutes that you can do in your office or at a distance. And at the end, we receive a full report that tells us how that client uh, performed compared to the performance of his or her peers. Now, that information can be utilized to customize their plan. Last week's training was on the focus assessment. So if you want more information on focus, make certain during that Q&A time you mention that to me so I can make certain that you do get more information on the focus assessment. The brief assessment is one that we typically use as well. And of course, the brief is a behavior rating of executive function. You can get a good overview of executive function and uh, it can be filled out by the parent or the teacher. If the client is above the age of 13, they can do a self-assessment. So 13 all the way up through adulthood can do self-assessments as well. You can also, of course, do parent, teacher, child, adult interviews. So I recommend that use an assessment, but then incorporate that with an interview so that you're not just looking at the assessment results and making some determinations, but take some time to review those results because that conversation is really going to help you customize each client's plan. And that's what we're going to do next. We're going to use that information to customize everyone's profile. So that's what I wanna show you here. Of course, when you are working on uh, your play attention session, you're going to set up your new, uh, your new students or your clients, and we're going to have the name, the login information, and you can select an avatar. You can see all of my students here on the right-hand side of the screen have a different avatar. Uh, you want to put in their age group. Now, when you select child, teen, adult in their profile, it doesn't change the level of difficulty. Remember, it just changes how the program looks. So a child is going to have more colors and rounded edges and child avatars, where an adult is going to have less colors, adult avatars, and straighter lines. So it's just the look and feel that changes. We're going to decide whether or not we're going to, to turn the behavior shaping component on or off. Remember the behavior shaping 
is uh, if they have self-distracting behaviors like fidgeting, nail biting, chewing on their shirts. If they have those behaviors, trust me, they're going to come up in the play attention session. So if they do have those behaviors, then we're going to keep the behavior shaping component on. If you just are working with an individual who is a daydreamer and only needs to focus on cognitive skill training and doesn't exhibit any behaviors, then we will turn it off. So that's a toggle that you can turn on and off. It does default to on. And I recommend if you're unsure, keep it on. We can always go back in and turn it off later. Then we're going to pinpoint the different cognitive exercises for that individual. So we're going to set up each individual's curriculum and decide the number of activities per session. How many activities in general is this individual going to work on? So remember, we do recommend everyone works at least an hour per week, and that's going to be broken up. So many professionals are doing two 30-minute sessions. So you're probably doing about five different activities each session. If you're working with an individual who's very young or perhaps an individual with autism, you might be going slower. You might be doing four 15-minute sessions then you'll probably want to do about three different activities and we'll set that up into their profile as well. And finally, we're going to talk about the circle of success. I think some of you underutilize this feature. So I'm really going to walk you through that so you can see the circle of success and how that is set up. So let's just look right now. I want to look at uh, a user. Of course, here are all my students. We can create a new student if you'd like. I'm going to go into one of my students and I'm just going to edit this student so that you can see everything in this student's file. Now, when we initially set up this student, of course, we can change the avatar and she selected a, a picture of herself. So we uploaded that um, into her avatar. We put in her first name, her last name, gave her a username. Email is optional and gave her a passcode. This is where you can designate male or female. And this is where I mentioned the age group, child, teen, or adult. Now remember, doesn't change the, uh, the difficulty level. It simply changes the look and feel of the background. Now over here is where we have some other options, okay? Journal enabled means at the end of the activity, they're going to have that journal. Keep that on, don't turn that off. We're going to talk about the importance of that. The bank is of course for your reward system. So we definitely uh, encourage that. The stars enabled means that sheer genius, your artificial intelligence is going to keep track of when that student can graduate to the next level. So I would really keep that on. The rating scale is what we talked about for behaviors. So if my student Lil here, if she um, doesn't have behaviors that we need to address, I would just unclick that and then that behavior rating chart won't appear at the end of the activity. But I'm going to keep that on because she does have behaviors that we wanna work on. And then always create a sheer genius um, session is disabled and uh, you can enable that as well. I recommend that you enable the sheer, genius, um, the sheer Genius session. So that means when Lil logs in, Sheer Genius is going to select the most appropriate activities for that day based on previous performance. And I do always recommend that you turn that on because it just really streamlines the process. So in general, I recommend, unless they do not have any behavior issues, that you keep all of these highlighted, okay? Now, the circle of success, this is what I was talking about earlier. This is where you will input the student's mother, father, grandparent, mentor, teacher, whoever is involved in that individual's life and can positively reinforce what you're doing within your play attention session. If you input their information within her profile, then you're going to be e able to easily access those individuals and send them progress reports. And I'm going to show you how to do that, but it starts with actually inputting those people into this program. So I'm gonna add a 
client or a, a contact will say that uh, this is Tom Lewis and the email address. Now I'm just going to put in one of ours uh, addresses, but you would put in that person's email address and then the relationship. This is her father, okay? So now I have Tom in here, okay? And I can continue adding contacts, teachers, mentors. Then when I want to send a report, I'll be able to access the circle of success and select who I want to send a progress report to. So really important. Now, here's our sheer genius settings. And you'll notice when we said right here, the number of activities per session, this is selected on three right now. That means that Sheer Genius, when she logs in, because we enabled Sheer Genius sessions, Sheer Genius is going to select the most appropriate three activities based on her previous performance, okay? So she's probably doing a 15 minute session. If she's going to do a 30 minute session, I'm going to change this to five. That means that Sheer Genius will select the most appropriate five activities for that session based on the previous performance. And then where does Sheer Genius get those? Well, from the curriculum that we're going to set down here. So all of the activities that are highlighted in blue are currently the activities we've designated as most important for Lil, for this particular student. I discovered recently that her student, her teacher said that she has a hard time following through with multiple step verbal instructions. So I'm going to go ahead and highlight auditory processing because I want this added into her curriculum, okay? So once I've added that, I've added her circle of success. I changed the number of activities per session. Then I'm going to go down here and I'm going to click save. And all of my changes have been saved. So remember, you can customize each client's profile to reflect their name, their special login, their age group, whether or not you're going to use the behavior shaping, pinpoint the different cognitive skills that are most important for that individual, tell Sheer Genius how many activities. Now remember, if you say three activities and Sheer Genius selects the most appropriate three activities, and then your student wants to do a bonus activity at the end, if your student has completed all three activities and goes back to the main menu screen, all of the other available activities will appear. So it is there is an opportunity to do more than three, but we're going to show them at least three to begin with, okay? Or whatever number you would put in there. And then uh, also that circle of success really important to use that circle of success. I know if you start using it, it will become something that you go to very often. All right, number three, consistency. Schedule your sessions and be consistent because without consistency, programs are disorganized. Students have a harder time making connections between what they're doing in their play attention session and how to apply it. The transfer and generalization is slower and graduation's going to take longer, okay? So it's really important that when you are setting up your client's schedule, that not only are you committed to being very consistent in the training, but the client is committed to being consistent in the training. So we do recommend at least an hour per week. And as we mentioned, that hour can be broken up. Can you do more than an hour per week? You can but we just caution you against burnout, remember? Because sometimes people think, well, if one is good, 10 is better. And that's not always true. So make certain that you're more concerned about the quality of your session rather than the quantity, okay? So at least an hour per week. And you'll typically start to see small steps of improvement after about six weeks of training. So that means that, you know, the parents will start reporting, you know, she sat down and she started her homework the second time I asked instead of the 10th time I asked. Or he had a spelling test 
and he actually remembered all of the words on his spelling test. Usually he knows them the day before, and then the day of the spelling test, he misses every single one and we can't figure out why, but now he did it. Or a, an adult might come to you and say, I'm more engaged in conversations. I'm following conversations. I'm not interrupting people when they're trying to talk to me. So you're going to start seeing these small steps of improvement. Some people, report earlier than six weeks, but that's an average. Average is about six weeks. Graduation time, of course, is around the 40 hour mark. So if you're working that hour per week, I would plan on anywhere between eight to 10 months of consistent training. So although you're seeing results all the way through, you're seeing these small steps of improvement, what you're not seeing is what's actually occurring in the brain. And that's that you're causing these new neural pathways to become formed. And in the beginning, remember those networks are weak, which means one day it'll look like they're doing beautifully. And then the next day it looks like they've never heard the word attention before. So there's going to be a little bit of up and down, which should be expected. But through the practice and repetition, you're actually strengthening those networks to a point of permanency. So when the parents ask about repetition and why is there so much repetition, it's not just repetition, it's repetition with goal setting, with immediate feedback. Adults too may have that question. And if we are going to gain permanency where we know that not only will you have these skills now at eight years old, but you're going to have them at 48, or not only will you have them at 48, but you'll have them at 68, we have to work to that point of permanency again, which takes around 40 hours. So around 40 hour mark, you'll want to make certain that your student is at all of the advanced skill options. This is a good time to do another post evaluation to make certain everything's transferred and generalized. If everything looks good, they can start graduating from the program. If it looks like there's more work to be done, because there may, that's just an average number, then we customize the plan and we keep going. Remember, if you need help in any of these portions, you have unlimited support. So make certain that you're reaching out to your executive function coach to help you with any of these features or with any of these tips that I mentioned today. Number four, start every session with a review of the previous session, okay? Every good lesson, no matter what you're teaching, starts with a review. After they log in, the very first screen that your student sees is data, data that tells them how they performed the last time they did these particular activities. It also will show them their best data uh, and their average data. And then it, their journal will be displayed as well, their journal from the previous session. So you have time to reflect and review. It also provides time for transition because a lot of times your students are rushing in from work or they're rushing into you from school. And uh, this is a good time to transition. Okay, let's look at what you did last time. That transition time, reflecting, getting mentally prepared for the session ahead is really important. So make certain, don't just skip through that screen, take some time and review everything that's on the screen. It's all there for you. You don't have to make up or figure out what to review. It's all there for you as soon as they log in. It also connects the current lesson to previous lessons. So of course, you're going to be able to talk about what they learned last time and what their objectives are this time. So it's going to help you make those connections and it gives the student time to demonstrate what he learned and what he remembers. Because remember, memory <laughs> is difficult, especially in the early sessions. So just have them reflect, have them talk about some of the things they learned at the last session, really uh, inspire them to start thinking about their previous sessions and what they've learned so that then they can easy, easier uh, easily apply them to this session. Tip number five, state the activity's objective. And in order for you to be able to state the activity's objective, you need to know the activity's objective, okay? 
you want to make certain you know the objective and how this, this activity relates back in the classroom, back at home or in the office. This is really important. And you want to make certain the client understands the activity. State what this client should be able to do as a result of practicing this activity. Discuss why it's relevant, okay? And this will all ensure transfer and generalization. So you really shouldn't start a session with the review and then, okay, attention stamina is the first one in your list on your curriculum today. And that's it. And then they go ahead and play. That's not ideal. An ideal session is where you talk about the objective. Why are they working on this activity? Do a reality check and make certain they understand the feedback of this activity. So ideally that conversation would be, this is attention stamina. We're going to work on that first. Do you remember why we work on attention stamina? What is our, what is our objective in attention stamina? And hopefully you've talked to your client enough so that they can tell you, or if they don't remember, you can reiterate, we work on attention stamina in order to teach you how to direct and sustain your attention at will, much like being able to pay attention to the teacher in the classroom or the boss in the workplace. So you see, I didn't just say, let's start attention stamina. We're talking about our objective, our reason, how this applies to real life, really important. Make certain you go through that main menu screen and you can explain the objective and how it relates for every single activity. Time on task. Time on task, we're teaching you how to start an assignment right away. Keep your attention just on that assignment until completion, closed end tasking. So now 15 minutes of homework is going to take 15 minutes and not two or three hours. Or for an adult, we're going to teach you how to start and complete in a timely manner. Do you feel like right now you start a million things and finish nothing? We're gonna end that, right, with time on task. So make certain the objective and how it applies is discussed, okay? And then also that reality check I talked about, make certain they know the feedback so tell me, how are you going to, or how does uh, attention stamina work? What do you need to do? Well, I'm going to see that character going across the screen. Once I'm focused and paying attention, I'm going to be able to push that character down to the bottom of the ocean just with my attention alone. As long as I'm paying attention, I have the character at the bottom. Okay, what happens when you're not paying attention? Well, when I'm not paying attention, he's going to start to float up. And then I have to control that behavior of daydreaming, focus back in in order to push it back down. So make certain they understand the, the feedback and what they're personally doing in order to activate the activity or to keep it going. Now, also, a lot of times I try to get my clients out of the habit of saying, I'm going to look at the character. And as long as I'm looking at the character and I'm focused, then I'm able to push it down. Make certain they understand this has nothing to do with where their eyes are. It's all about how attentive they are. So try to get them into that practice where they're actually talking about being able to push the character down just with their mind alone, just with their attention. It's much more powerful and makes a lot more sense, okay? Number six, goal setting. So review the goals for the day. Each session has a behavioral goal if you're working on behaviors and an educational goal. You want to make certain they have those goals. Then the student knows what he wants to achieve, knows what to concentrate on and what to improve. So there's no just going through the motions. There's a specific goal. It does increase motivation to achieve it increases a sense of pride and satisfaction and performance because if they have a goal and they reach that goal, of course, they're going to feel satisfaction at the end. And then also, when you set goals and they start achieving these goals, they can see a clear forward progress on something that may seem to be a long process, right? 
So when they reach those mini goals, even if they've been coming to you for, you know, four months and they're in this process and it seems to them, you know, four months for an individual who's 10 years old, it seems like a long time, right? But it helps them when you set those goals and have that motivation in place, it really helps them see, I am progressing. Even though this is a long-term process, I'm progressing towards a higher level of achievement. So make certain you review those goals and all of the goals, just like the review, it, they're all stated for you. So you don't have to come up with those. Sheer genius always comes up with the stated objective, the stated goal. So you don't have to really come up with the goal on your own. It's there. What you do want to discuss with them, though, is how they're going to reach that goal. If you're a, you, your goal is to maintain 72% attention or higher, what are you going to do to reach that? What did you learn the last session that really helped you with your attention? So make certain, again, you're having them reflect and talk about how they're going to reach the goal. What strategies, what skills have they developed over time that they can utilize in order to reach that goal? And number seven, make certain you use the behavior shaping tool. Remember the behavior shaping tool, there are two parts to that. So you have that wet erase board that came in your package. And then after each activity, if you have the behavior shaping turned on, that behavior shaping tool is going to pop up and you're going to take the information from your wet erase board and you're going to put it into your electronic form, okay? The client at this point, when you're using that behavior shaping, it is a very positive experience because they're no longer being told what to do, what not to do. You're simply guiding them through that process. The student gets a one-to-one -one correlation on how that behavior affects his or her attention. And then over time, he actually learns that he can control these behaviors. I'm going to give you an example of this. And this was from one of my students, uh, Jaylon. Jaylon was in my second grade class and he would call out constantly. I would be teaching math. He'd call out what he did over the weekend, just random things, anything that came to mind, he would call out. And when I originally asked him, I said, why do you think it's important that you don't call out? And he said, because you tell me not to. So he had absolutely no idea why it was important. You know, even before that part though, I think he was completely unaware of it. And you may see this in some of your clients that they'll call out or they'll be chewing their shirt or biting their nails or picking their fingers. And you ask them to stop and they look at you like, I didn't even know I was doing that. So a lot of them are unaware of it. And then when you point it out and ask them, you know, why should you try to control that. They don't really know other than it bothers my teacher, it bothers you. Um, and so that's really not enough to make a change. But in the activities, let's say they're playing attention stamina and let's say they chose the whale and they have that whale going across the screen. And this happened with Jaylon and he had the whale going at the top of the screen, he focused in, pushed that whale all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. And then he called out, I like SpaghettiOs. And immediately that whale started to float up because he was no longer as attentive. And then I have a teachable moment. What happened to that whale when you called out? Well, he floated up. So what does that mean? It means I'm not paying attention. So in the classroom, when you do that, what does that mean? It means I'm not paying attention. So now again, it's not me telling him what to do and what not to do. I'm guiding him through the process. And then once you track those behaviors, sheer genius is going to start selecting and setting behavioral objectives. And that's really powerful in and of itself because now over time, they actually start to see that they're controlling these behaviors. Their graph starts to go down. They see that they're controlling these behaviors, which is really empowering because many of your students, and you know this, especially if you're working with individuals who are, you know, in that 10 to 16 realm where they feel like everything is outside of their control, 
Now you're showing them that they can control this. Okay. That's really powerful in behavior shaping. And, you know, I would get back to the classroom and I'd be teaching and Jaylon would call out, but he'd cover his mouth and he'd look at me like, you are right. I do do that. So now he's developed this awareness and more importantly, he knows he can control it. We had that discussion, you know, now you are sitting in this session for 30 minutes and you don't call out at all. Now I expect it in the classroom. And this is important because I had the benefit at that time to uh, have him in my classroom and be working with him on play attention. And so I saw him in both places. If you don't have that ability, then that's where the circle of success is really important. Because if I was just working on play attention with him, I would have his teacher's information and say to her or him, we are working on controlling his, his calling out. When you see that he controls this, please positively reinforce in the classroom. That's the circle. That's where you're getting other people involved to help with that transfer and generalization. Okay, tip number eight. At the end of the activity, discuss performance. Help your student develop self-monitoring, okay? So at the end of each activity, don't just run into the next activity. Okay, you finished attention stamina, let's go on to visual tracking. Okay, more time. Really allow them time to self-monitor. Ask prompting questions. Was the goal met? Your goal was to achieve 72% attention and you were 76% attentive. That was great, you met your goal. If it was met, how did you do that? What did you do personally in order to achieve that goal? And you know, sometimes they might not know and you might say, well, you know what I noticed? I noticed that when the character started going up or when the activity stopped and you were no longer as attentive, you sat back, you took a deep breath and then you were able to activate the game again. So have them really um, think about what they achieved and reflect on their performance. And now some of you are uh, asking questions, raising your hand. Remember, the Q&A is going to be at the end of the session. We're going to end this session, take about a 30 minute, minute break and then come back for that Q&A. So you can type in your questions, but just know I can't see them right now. I'm gonna address everyone at the end of this particular session, okay? But do keep your questions in mind or jotted down. And if the goal was not met, talk about what you could do next time to improve. All right, tip number nine, take advantage of teachable moments. We talked about the one teachable moment with the behaviors. Um, this is an unplanned opportunity to provide insight. You want to discuss how any behaviors, strategies, or improvements made during the activity uh, and discuss how these strategies can be used back in the classroom and back at home. So you really want to take advantage of these times. And that means that you have to observe your client and start recognizing certain things so that you can pick those out so that you can model this reflection and take advantage of those teachable moments. You know, it may be after an activity to have a conversation with them. Did you notice what happened? You were working on time on task and you were moving that truck across the screen and then Mrs. Smith walked into the room and did you notice anything? Yeah, I noticed I was able to keep that character moving. That's right. You kept the activity going. You didn't look at Mrs. Smith. You didn't get distracted by Mrs. Smith. You filtered that noise and you were able to keep your activity going. You stayed focused on your goal. That was really great, okay? So teachable moments, make certain that you are observing your student and you're able to discuss things that occurred in the uh, session that were really positive and that they can start applying. So that's just like in the classroom. If someone walks into the classroom, you don't necessarily have to look at that, that individual and get off task. You can continue working and uh, address that at a later time. Make certain you know how to filter those distractions. 
So all of that conversation and picking up on those social on those um, on those teachable moments is really going to help develop metacognition, where they're better able to self-regulate and self-monitor and start applying these strategies back in other areas. Number 10, use the academic bridge. If you have not been using academic bridge, then it's really important that you start incorporating academic bridge. And this is the focus here is to um, really ensure transfer and generalization of the skills learned. So you're going to select work on their independent level. Remember, this is not a time to teach them how to do math or how to read. The goal here is to teach them how to pay attention to the math, how to pay attention to the reading, okay? That's our goal. So you wanna select work on their independent level. You can also bring in work that is maybe a little um, difficult for them because they get anxious. So if you have a client who has test anxiety or subject anxiety, this is a really good application to bring those activities in. So you're going to make certain that your client takes, oops, let me just go here, takes all of these skills and I'm going to turn my sound down here. Um, whoops, I'm sorry about that. Okay, there we go. So that your student is going to be able to take all of the skills that he's learned within play attention and apply them. So you see my student here, she has the body wave armband on. Now she is not looking at academic bridge. She's not looking at the screen because that body wave armband is monitoring not where her eyes are, it's monitoring her how attentive she is. So as long as she's paying attention to her reading, she's able to push that red bar up above the midline, okay? Now she's not looking at the screen. So she hears from the computer, good, great. Then she knows she's in that state she needs to be in in order to process and finish that. Now you see she's getting distracted. She's no longer as attentive and that red bar goes down below the midline and she hears focus. Now she knows she's not in that state she needs to be in in order to process the information and finish this activity. So this again is where you're asking your clients to take all of the skills they've learned within play attention and apply them to real work activities. Now you are going to change the activity depending on the individual. Some of you may be working with adults. So that is something you need to discuss with them. What do they have difficulty paying attention to? I was working with an adult who was a teacher and she was struggling with grading papers. And she was a high school English teacher. So you can imagine the amount of grading and reading she had to do. And it was really hard for her to maintain her attention to it. So she was spending her entire weekend on grading papers. And so what we started doing was to incorporate the academic bridge while she was grading papers. And she learned a lot about herself. She learned that things she was doing that she thought was helping her, like playing music in the background, it wasn't helping her. We did different uh, tests and measures and that music was not helping her attention. We could see it. We could see it in real time and compare and contrast when she was grading papers while music was on and when she was paying attention, uh, grading papers and with music off. And there was a significant difference. So we knew that wasn't helping her. We worked on time of day. We worked on how to sustain that attention, filter distractions. And now she's down to two hours on the weekend instead of two days. A lot of your adult clients, even your, your young clients, they're spending so much time. They're, they're working so hard. And this is an opportunity for you to start incorporating actual skills, actual work activities or homework assignments so that they can learn what it looks like to pay attention on screen to the different play attention activities and how to apply them. All right, tip number 11. 
time for reward and positive reinforcement. So remember, you have a reward system within play attention. And a reward system, if it's done right, can help your client with ADHD persevere on tasks that they might typically give up on, right? Uh, you want to set up short-term and long-term result uh, rewards. Short-term rewards, a lot of times, especially when you just start working with clients, they want instant gratification. They want that immediate uh, feedback and reward. And so have some small things that they can purchase. Now, remember the points are given to them based on the goals that Sheer Genius sets. So when you see here, you see Lil has zero because she just started or maybe she um, just purchased a reward. Janet has one, Jack has no points. Mike has 56, he's been saving. Lynn has 63. So all of these are the points that have been awarded um, that haven't been used yet based on the goals that Sheer Genius set. So Sheer Genius said, let's pay attention or uh, have less than two impulsive strikes and you reach that goal. So then you earned a point and it shows up here. And then you can use that point for your rewards. So short-term rewards are going to be small rewards that maybe they can purchase at the end of the session or quite possibly at the end of the week. Okay, so they're little rewards that don't cost too much. And uh, also you want long-term rewards because we know through many studies that the ability to delay gratification is really critical to success in life, okay? And uh, if you have never watched the marshmallow study that was done back in the 60s and it's been redone several times, it's a great study to look at. But we know that delayed gratification is really important. However, it's a difficult skill for individuals who have attention problems or ADHD, right? That impulse control, they want that immediate gratification. So by setting up long-term rewards where the reward might cost a hundred points and they have to earn it, they have to bank their points and work towards it. That's teaching them how to delay gratification for a larger reward, okay? Really important. And then they can purchase the rewards with their points. And when they purchase rewards, it's all about recognizing their achievement. And when they're recognizing this achievement, their self-perception goes from I can't to I can. You're reinforcing that positive um, self-esteem. You're reinforcing what they can do. Okay, so let me show you because some of you I know haven't really set up a reward system or don't know all the features that you actually have available to you when looking at points and rewards. So I'm going to go down here <clears throat> to my student Lynn and first I'm going to check out our rewards. So first right now I'm logged in as a coach. I'm going to click on the rewards. And you see all of the rewards that I've currently set up. So we have a trip to an amusement park, go to the movies. And you see over here that the trip to an amusement park is 100 points. So that's my long-term goal. Go to the movies is 45. So that's a pretty big, big reward as well. Um, I don't have any real small ones. So let's go ahead and create a new reward that maybe is not going to cost too much. So I'm gonna create a reward and the reward is going to say, bring Skippy to the park. Skippy is uh, our dog and it's gonna cost five points um, because you know Skippy needs to go to the park. So it's not gonna have a high point value. And uh, I'm going to just type in a little description here now this is, if let's say I am a coach in a center like many of you are, and the te teacher or the parent, let's say the parent, Lynn's mom said, she can bring Skippy to the park if she gets five play attention points, okay? So that means it's only available for Lynn. So I'm going to go ahead here and I'm going to highlight Lynn. 
Usually you can say it's available for all students, but this is Lynn's mom giving me that reward. So I'm going to make it specific for Lynn. That means Lynn is the only one that's going to see this in her reward system. So again, you can customize the rewards based on that individual. And then I'm going to change the picture. So let's see if I have um, something I can do here on desktop. And oh, I have lots on here, don't I? Uh, I have my dog here. So there's my dog, Skippy. I have the reward set up for five points, Lynn, and I'm gonna save the reward. Okay, so there it is. So now you see I created that reward. And at any time you can go in here and you can edit these rewards as well. All right, now also with rewards, you have a couple of other things that you may not have realized. And that is you can give a reward immediately, meaning they don't have to store up points and then purchase it. They just did a fantastic job. They got an A plus on a, a big report they've been working on and you just wanna give them a reward. Or maybe you just wanna give them points for something that the teacher sent back a report to you that said, you know, he is able to control his calling out. He did a really good job today, didn't call out at all during class. And you think that he should earn some points for that. So there is a way within their file that you can actually give a reward right away or give them more points. So let's go down to Lynn here. So again, I'm logged in as a coach. I'm going to click on Lynn and uh, I'm in her data right now. So this is all of her data so far. I'm going to scroll uh, down here to the bottom and it tells me the rewards she's already uh, purchased and when she redeemed them. So she redeemed the sleepover on May 16th, 2019. She's been with me a long time. <laughs> so you see that uh, she has all her rewards that she's done here. So remember the teacher gave me a great report. So I'm going to say Lynn today, just because that teacher gave me a great report, great feedback, I'm going to give you five extra points for the day. Okay, and I'm going to click give. So now those points go into her bank. Or let's say that she finished a report. She's been working on it really hard. It took a lot of the skills that we were working on within Play Attention. She had to plan and prioritize and organize. And she ended up getting an A on that report. So I'm not going to have her purchase the reward with her play attention points, I'm just going to give her that reward. So I click give a reward and I think I'm gonna give her the pizza that she's been wanting. So I give the reward and now that is going to go in to her uh, reward center so that when she logs in, she's gonna see that reward. So three things that I just did as coach, I went in, I created new rewards, I could edit old rewards, I customized a reward just for one of my clients. I have 10 clients, but I customized a one reward for one client based on what the parent told me. Then I went in and I gave points because that individual earned more points. And then I also went in and I gave, um, gave the reward, just went ahead and gave that reward, okay? Now I wanna show you what happens here if we go in as Lynn, so I'm going to log out as myself and I'm going to log in as Lynn. So you can see how we actually redeem this. Okay. So now I'm logged in as Lynn and she can see right away that she has 68 points. She's going to go to the rewards tab and oh, there's the reward I gave her. So now she sees that I gave her the pizza and she can click to redeem now and she can just go ahead and say she wants to re she wants to print it because if they want a hard copy to show their parents or their teacher what they got they can print it or just redeem it okay and then it gets moved into her archive here then we can also look at buying rewards because remember she has 68 points she's really been eyeing this trip to the amusement park but you notice that it's 100 points and she doesn't have enough money or enough play attention points, I should say, to purchase that reward. So she is going to click on it and drag it up to her long-term rewards, 
okay? And now I dragged it into the long-term rewards and you see I have 68 of 100 points, okay? Now, I do want to save up towards that, but I really want that sleepover. So I'm going to click on the sleepover and I'm gonna go ahead and purchase it right now. And you notice now that sleepover is in my rewards and my goal setting here, my long-term reward has gone down to, now I have 38 of 100 points. So they're gonna see how that instant gratification that I just wanted changes my long-term goal. I had over 60 points towards the amusement park, but I went ahead and did that sleepover. So now I'm down to 38. So this is a great teachable moment to incorporate that reward system in order to teach short-term and long-term rewards, and also to positively reinforce what they are learning and change their self-image from I can, I can't to I can. All right, let me go ahead and log out. And you know, don't just think this is just for kids. Adults do really well with rewards. So make certain that if you're working with adults, that you're setting up rewards for the adults as well, not just for children, okay? All right, next, what's our next tip here? Number 12, and do not skip this step. You notice that that's what I said here, don't skip this step. That at the end of the session, make certain you take time for reflection, okay? This gives students time to discuss what was learned and how to assimilate that knowledge. That when we talk about reflection at the end, again, it's nothing you have to come up with. The very last, uh, the last screen that your student sees when you click log out is the journal entry. Don't skip the journal entry. Take some time to reflect what I learned what I'm proud of, what I need to improve. What I need to improve is auto-populated, right? By sheer genius. So that's auto-populated. Uh, what I'm proud of, what I need to improve, you know, that sometimes is difficult for them. So use prompting questions and be positive and be very specific. So if you say, well, what, did, what are you proud of today? And they say, I'm proud that I, I finished the session. That's a little vague, okay? Let's be really specific, all right? So make certain you look at real small things, big things, whatever occurred during the session and model for them. You know, I was really proud of you because when Mrs. Smith walked into the room, you didn't look at her, you didn't uh, turn in your seat, you were able to keep your focus on your character, on your specific task, you filtered that distraction. That was really good. So you need to model this because a lot of times you'll get answers that aren't really specific, but you'll also get answers that, you know, really won't help them in the future on how to apply certain skills. So make certain you model and you will be surprised. The more you model reflection, the more you talk, they are listening to you and you will be shocked at what they start coming up with. I had one little girl I worked with, Jessica. She was young, she was six years old and she was highly distractible. Before she would come into the room, I would move everything away from the desk. If there was a little piece of paper on the desk, she would be on it, that would distract her. So I never said anything, I would just move everything away. And then we would go ahead and do the session. I'd do a lot of modeling, a lot of talking, you know, especially because she was really young. And by talking and modeling, I was helping develop that metacognition, right? That self-monitoring. And uh, so about two months into the process, she came into the session and she had a box of crayons. And she said, I'm going to take this crayon and I'm going to put it on the desk. And I'm not going to look at it. I'm not going to touch it. And I'm going to be able to keep that character at the bottom of the ocean. Now that was amazing. Six years old, she had reflected, she knew she was distracted, and she set a goal for herself. 
So that was a process, but really important. And then she'd finish that activity and she'd say, now I'm going to put two crayons down. <laughs> so she was actually increasing the level of difficulty. So again, the more you get involved in the session, the technology is great, but the more you get involved, the more you're going to have a successful session and that transfer and generalization that we're working towards. Now, tip number 13, send those updates to your circle of success because it really does take a village. The more people involved in really encouraging and, uh, and reinforcing the work you're doing, the better it will be. It improves communication. Okay, it gives the parents and mentors and teachers, spouses, the ability to positively reinforce the behaviors and skills. And of course, it helps with transfer and generalization. So let me show you how to do this. If you're uncertain, remember we set up for Lil, we set up um, some people in her circle of success. I've also set some up for Mike here. So let's go into Mike and I'm going to generate a report. And you see down here that all of his data is stored for me. So I can look at all of his data, his behavioral data. I can look at correlation data. All of that is there. Now I want to communicate with some people in his circle of success. So then I'm going to click here where it says email circle of success. And I can type that Mike and I are working on following multiple step instructions. Please reinforce. Okay, you can write a lot more, but you wanna write something and you can send it to everyone in your circle of success or you can just select the person or you know a couple of people you wanna send that specific report to. And then if you also want to include a PDF of all of that uh, data that we just looked at, you just click there um, to send without or you unclick it to send it with the PDF and then click send. And all of that information is emailed to the people you designated in the circle of success. That communication, that circle is so important. And so I do hope if some of you have not been using that circle of success that you use it now. You know, a lot of you are in school settings and even it's a good way to communicate with teachers right away, right? That you don't have to get up and, and you know, go to the classroom and talk to them about it. You can right away in the moment, type up what you've been working on, what to positively reinforce back in the classroom, back in the workplace, back at home. And it really helps with that transfer and generalization. And my final tip for you all is to make certain that you're always having fun and changing lives. So I do hope that everything we discussed here really helps you. I hope you learned about some new strategies you haven't been using. And also you have learned how to maybe implement some of the strategies more effectively. Maybe it gave you a new perspective on some of the strategies you've been using, and now you have a better understanding of why you're doing it and how to make it more effective for your clients. So all of these behaviors, all of these uh, tips and strategies are important within a play attention session. And again, you're going to receive the recording of this session if you have any questions on how to implement them, make certain that you reach out to us. If you need a little bit of clarification on any of these features, make certain you reach out to us. You have unlimited support with your executive function coach. So make certain you reach out to that individual and let us help you every step of the way. Now, we're going to take a 30 minute break right now. I want you during this 30 minute break to reflect on everything we discussed, grab a snack, type down or jot down your questions and uh, we will come back. I will keep the session up. So even if you want to uh, start typing some of your questions or comments in the chat box, um, you'll be able to do that. And then when we come back after 30 minutes, 
Uh, we will do a Q&A on the section we just reviewed, and then we'll go right into iLab features. And remember, even if you haven't started iLab yet, this is going to be a great opportunity to learn about iLab, how to run small group sessions or how to do distance training that may really spark some ideas on how to expand or change your business model a bit. All right, thank you so much, everyone. It's uh, been a lot of information, but I do hope it's been valuable to you. And I will see you back here in about 30 minutes.